basically the 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 theme of my my speech today is about the issues that we care so much about. Um, you know, you look at issues like gun control or abortion or police reform and accountability, and you have wide public support for each of these things, um, but we don't see it reflected in policy necessarily. Um, and I want to I want to underscore some issues structurally in our country that that explain to some extent why we are where we are. So let me uh, let me begin. So this year uh, we will celebrate the 235th anniversary of the signing of our Constitution. But what precisely should we celebrate? In the summer of 1787, the nation's founders created a remarkable framework for our government, uh, a framework that quite literally had no parallel in human history. But their framework was deeply, deeply flawed. Since individual liberty was largely not protected from the power of government in the original constitution, a bill of rights was later added that reflected a broader vision of freedom and liberty. Thomas Jefferson famously said, Quote, a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth and what no just government should refuse. The bill of rights was needed to protect individual rights from injustice, from the tyranny of a majority trampling the rights of a minority. But as we know, even with the bill of rights, even with this expanded vision of liberty and freedom, the constitution remained fundamentally flawed and unjust. It protected slavery. There are 10 different clauses in the Constitution that implicate slavery, protecting it directly or indirectly. The Constitution we celebrate today, amended by the Bill of Rights, required a bloody civil war before further amendments promised that Black Americans would be brought within the ambit of its protection. But even then, for still another century, until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 redeemed the promise of the Civil War amendments, racial segregation and racial discrimination remain deeply embedded in our laws, our institutions, our culture. All told, it took more than 175 years after, after the Constitution was written and approved before federal civil rights laws outlawed racial discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and voting. And what's true for the struggle for racial equality is also true for other struggles. The words women, gender, and sex do not appear in the Constitution, revealing the limits of the Founders' narrow understanding of citizenship. And as we know, and as we've seen recently, there's implications uh, given how our constitution is interpreted to what words are there and what words aren't and what pronouns are there and what pronouns aren't. It wasn't until 1920 that the 19th amendment gave white women the right to vote. And it wasn't until 1964, also through the Civil Rights Act, that women gained protection against discrimination at work. And not until 1972 through Title IX that women gain the right to equality in education. If the framers intentionally left out Black people and women, they didn't even consider including Native Americans, LGBTQ people, children, people who were unhoused, immigrants, people with a disability, among many, many others. For nearly all of our history, these groups were largely unprotected. But one by one, they and their allies have worked to make sure that the Constitution applies to them. These are flaws that I hope uh, are well known and understood. There was another key flaw, though. The Constitution assumed that the branches of government would serve as a sufficient check on each other and protect people from government overreach. But what happens when Congress and the president agree on violating the Constitution? Or when Congress is unwilling or unable to challenge constitutional violations by the executive branch? And what happens when a state violates the Constitution and the federal government is unwilling to do anything about it? 
The conventional answer is that the courts will step in. The courts can't act on their own. They're powerless to protect civil rights or civil liberties unless an aggrieved person, someone whose rights have been violated and who has been harmed by the government, steps up to challenge the constitutional violation. In 1910, the NAACP was established, followed 10 years later by the ACLU. These organizations gradually developed the resources and the skill to challenge constitutional violations on behalf of people who could not have done it alone. Tennessee school teacher John Scopes would not have been able to challenge the law making it a crime to teach evolution without the ACLU and its volunteer attorney Clarence Darrow. And Oliver Brown could not have challenged Kansas's public school segregation laws on behalf of his eight-year-old daughter, Linda, without the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall. If not for organizations like the NAACP and the ACLU and so many others that have been founded in the decades since, constitutional law would not have developed as we now know it. 101 years ago, or actually 102 years ago now, when the ACLU was founded, the suppression of speech, of free speech, was routine. For example, many states made it illegal to advocate for political or economic change through violence. Armed with these laws, authorities across the country ignored the requirement of violence and targeted labor unionists, socialists, communists, and they arrested, convicted, and imprisoned thousands of people when they were engaged in peaceful protests or even just meetings. Despite its clear and lofty language, the First Amendment provided absolutely no defense. Indeed, when the ACLU was founded in 1920, the Supreme Court had never upheld a free speech claim, not one. Things began slowly to change only because people increasingly began to speak up, to gather, to organize. And when their rights were violated, they now had organizations and lawyers to represent them in court, take on the government and seek vindication of their rights. So to my mind, when we celebrate the constitution, we mustn't celebrate the document drafted at the Philadelphia Convention and not necessarily even those who penned words onto parchment. What we must celebrate are the people in succeeding generations who accepted their responsibility for our governing document and worked tirelessly to expand its protections and make its promises more real than its drafters could ever have imagined. The work of perfecting our constitution is not done and I don't think it'll ever be done. I don't think we can ever achieve perfection. The philosopher Isaiah Berlin was fond of saying that, quote, out of the cro crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Uh, and I very much adhere to that as a basic premise for everything when it comes to human endeavors. Another flaw that has become readily apparent in our constitutional system is one we're living through right now. The founders worried so much about the tyranny of the majority, but minority rule has become a defining feature of our American Republic. And I mean minority rule in the sense of a political group dictating national policy outcomes, imposing its values and its programs, even when most Americans oppose them. In 2000 and 2016, Candidates who received fewer votes than their opponents nevertheless won the White House. We all know that the Electoral College introduces an anti-democratic feature and a certain amount of randomness by allocating electors on a state level, winner-take-all basis, that has deviated from the national popular vote. And the question is, is this a bug in the system uh, or is it a feature? Congress actually reflects a more troubling dynamic that likely will only get worse over time. Consider that in, in 2020, Democrats and Republicans each won 50 states and 50 seats in the Senate. But the Democratic half represents nearly 42 million more people than the Republican half. 
That's a lot of people in our country. That's about 12 and a half percent of the population. We know that the US Senate by design amplifies the power of voters in small states at the expense of voters in big states because every state gets two senators irrespective of the state's population. The least populous state, Wyoming, has the same voting power in the Senate as the most populous state, California, which is 68 times larger. Given how America's political geography has developed in the past two centuries, causing small states to look very different demographically from large states, the Senate now effectively privileges white rural interests over those of Black and Latino city dwellers. It's bad and likely will get worse. By 2040, it's estimated that roughly 70% of the country will be represented by about 30 senators. The remaining 30% of Americans who are disproportionately wider, older, more rural, more conservative, will be represented by 70 senators. Now let's go back to those presidential elections in 2000 and 2016 to see how one undemocratic feature combines with and augments another. George W. Bush made two appointments to the Supreme Court, John Roberts and Samuel Alito, and Trump made three, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. These appointments, as we know, move the court decidedly to the right, with conservatives now holding a 63 majority over the more liberal justices. The Supreme Court will be ruling on key issues facing the country. We've already seen what the court did in striking down Roe versus Wade. Decisions and policies supported by most Americans could be ruled unconstitutional, all because a president who lost the popular vote nominated three justices and senators representing a minority of the American population confirmed them. Think about that. They were nominated by a president who did not have a majority behind him and they were confirmed by a majority of the Senate that represents a minority of the country. That doesn't make any sense. It's one thing to ensure that the rights of political and other minorities are respected and our Bill of Rights does that, imposing limitations on what majority rule can do when it comes to fundamental rights. But it's another thing altogether to give a political minority the power to rule. Scholars of democracy have warned that minority rule is dangerous. First, minority rule undermines the legitimacy of governing, governing institutions. And we see this reflected in public surveys all the time now. A basic principle of democratic legitimacy is that a government must have a majority support in order to make policy. A government that allows the minority to rule over the majority, especially over a prolonged period of time, fundamentally violates this principle. Second, and more dangerously, minority rule can enable and cause the minority party to take increasingly anti-democratic actions to entrench its power by, for example, changing the rules to make it harder for its opponents to win elections. Mm -hmm. Because the minority party by definition is less popular and because it proposes few policies that are popular with the society at large and some that are outright unpopular, it must, in the words of historian Timothy Snyder, either quote, fear democracy or weaken it. And this is what we are seeing. Since control of the White House and the Senate flipped in 2020, we've seen an unprecedented wave of proposed restrictions on voting. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, between January 1st and July 14th of 2021, at least 18 states enacted 30 laws that restricted access to the vote. These laws made mail voting, early voting more difficult, they imposed stricter voter ID requirements, and made faulty voter purges more likely, among other things. In all, more than 400 bills with provisions restricting voting access were introduced in 49 states 
in the 2021 legislative year. Moreover, since the 2020 election, 26 states have enacted, expanded, or increased the severity of 120 election-related criminal penalties. These states, I think all but one, majority Republican controls, have created more than 60 new felonies and 50 new misdemeanors. These laws not only cover actions that might be called voter fraud, but also the activities of people trying to assist voters or assisting, uh, attempting to make an election run smoothly. Now, the only way to prevent minority rule and to mitigate it is through major structural reform. Things like eliminating the filibuster, ending partisan gerrymandering, enshrining a fundamental right to vote in the Constitution, giving statehood to Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico to make the Senate more reflective of the entire country. But that won't happen without some measure of bipartisan support. And there's unfortunately little political incentive to adopt these kinds of reforms for those who can hold on to power without winning the most votes or even trying to appeal to the most voters. In the words of uh, Joan Didion, I don't know how long the center can hold uh, in this way, but I do know this, the only solution can and will come from all of us. The constitution we live by today does not belong to those who wrote the version ratified in 1788, it belongs to us. Each generation has a responsibility to do its part in its own time to proclaim and pursue equal human dignity. And like generations before, we must now do our part. We have to face the situation boldly with, the, with so much at stake now, the right to speak, the right to assemble, the right to petition the government, and the right to vote. These are no longer just roads, uh, excuse me, these are no longer just rights, they are now obligations. We must educate, we must talk to each other. Our parties may be incapable of bipartisanship, but we the people aren't. We have to reach out to family, friends, and neighbors, and even those who might disagree with us. I know it's difficult, I have family members that in many respects I've written off. I don't think we can do that. I don't think we can afford to do that. We have to organize. Many people point to demographic change as our salvation, but demographic change alone cannot and will not save us. We can't assume that it will bring the change that we wanna see. We have to mobilize and demonstrate. When any of us are attacked, we have to speak up and speak out. We must develop and amplify the voice of a new majority. We have to work to build an expansive and inclusive vision of America, one that says that we're all in this together and that recognizes that our rights, our humanity, our dignity are all bound together. We have to speak up and speak out for each other. We have to make our voices heard in the streets and town halls and at the ballot box. And we have to unleash our collective roar, our collective voice, for human rights and human dignity. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, that was great. Um, I know there's going to be a number of people I'm looking for hands going up. Uh, Steve. Well, thank you, Hector. Um, and I'm, I do have a lot of questions and I may ask one and then get back on the stack to allow time for others. I'll slip in that I would love at some point for you to develop uh, what the agenda in Southern California affiliate is and the initiatives and ballot measures and um, holding the sheriff accountable and those kinds of issues, because I know those are very much at, at, on your mind. Uh, but my question uh, is a little more theoretical, but I think this audience will, uh, will appreciate your thoughts. Uh, the recent Supreme Court decisions, which on which we'd love to have your thoughts, 
uh, have elevated a doctrine called originalism uh, that uh, some trace back to Robert Bork, um, the fortunately rejected Supreme Court nominee years ago. Uh, could you unpack, because you alluded to your sense of the Constitution as a living document, uh, originalism freezes the Constitution, uh, both at the time of its writing and the time of the Civil War Amendment. So we have some time here today and expand on, on why that, that theory is such a threat uh, to uh, people's rights. And then if you choose, um, give us your take on the recent Supreme Court rulings. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, originalism uh, started out as sort of a fringe doctrine, uh, like so many. Um, and it has become in many ways the dominant um, method for interpreting our Constitution, certainly at the Supreme Court. And as you said, Steve, what it tries to do is give effect to the meaning of the words and phrases uh, as they were understood at the time. Uh, and that's deeply problematic uh, when, as I, as I laid out, our Constitution at these various crucial points, intentionally or otherwise, left people out of its protection. Um, there, are, there are frightening implications to an originalist um, interpretation of the Constitution. Um, as I mentioned, there is no reference to women in the Constitution. Uh, I've seen articles that analyze the pronouns used in the Constitution. Obviously, we uh, there's a lot of they and them, uh, but there's a lot of he and him and his. Um, there is no she or her or hers. Um, and there is actually one reference uh, to electors, to elected officials being male. Um, and uh, Professor Chemerinsky has pointed out uh, for many years now that applied literally um, and applied given the understanding of the constitution when it was adopted, uh, we should not have, we should, it should be impermissible for a woman to be president um, under the constitution. Um, as you said, uh, you know, it applies to things when they were adopted. So the 14th amendment was adopted coming out of the civil war, um, its purpose, was largely uh, to protect uh, the, the rights of the formerly enslaved people. Justice Scalia, on that basis, would argue and did argue that the 14th Amendment did not protect women, that it was meant to protect Black people in the United States. Um, I think using his logic, you might question whether the 14th Amendment would protect people with other national origin or of other races or ethnicities, um, given the clear intent coming out of the Civil War um, to protect African-Americans. Um, there are many um, who have pointed out the hypocrisy of those who consider themselves originalists because they seem to invent these get out of jail free cards whenever they need them. Uh, so whenever the original understanding doesn't work for them, they find some way to avoid it. Um, most notably, the Second Amendment. Um, you know, the, the language about a well-regulated militia has in effect been written out of uh, the Second Amendment by the Supreme Court. And the, the interpretation that is now prevailing at the, at the Supreme Court was ridiculed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s because it ignored the, the plain language of the Second Amendment. Um, um, and yet here we are uh, with the enshrined right to individuals to bear arms. Um, when it comes to uh, Dobbs, uh, the decision striking down Roe versus Wade, 
there are folks, interestingly enough, who have pointed out that there are ways in which the originalist uh, effort is about a selective reading of history. Um, uh, Professor uh, Michelle Goodwin and others have pointed out that the folks who drafted the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment, the folks who wanted to abolish slavery, were very clear in their minds and in their words that one of the things that they were trying to abolish um, was the tradition in the South of white slave owners uh, raping uh, their female slaves and forcing them to carry uh, pregnancies to term uh, against their will. Um, and that history uh, is completely ignored uh, by the Dobbs decision. Uh, so you have a situation where the focus is on interpreting history and an understanding at a certain point in time but it's not necessarily a comprehensive or um, full view of the history at the time either. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, when you read the Dobbs decision, one of the things that's so troubling is that they keep saying that they're looking for whether abortion has been deeply rooted in our traditions. Well, if we start to, go into the box of things that are deeply rooted in our traditions in this country, what are we looking at? <laughs> Slavery, Jim Crow, uh, the subordination of women, uh, no protection uh, for so many people in this country. Um, so it really is anchoring uh, the country um, at a time when despite the lofty words that they wrote and ratified, the understanding of who, who was created equal was very different from what we have today. Uh, you know, even, even among white men, it was white property men, white propertied men who were deemed the ones who were eligible to vote, not anyone else. Um, so it's a deeply problematic, um, way to interpret the Constitution, that really it's it's almost like a magnet that draws us back to the worst <clears throat> aspects of our history and tries to prevent us from, from giving full meaning to the words that, that were enacted. Well, okay, we have Rose, Richard, Phil, and Stephen. Um, so let's see if we can get everybody in. Rose? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you. That was just incredible. One of the best presentations I've heard in a long, long time. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I said in my introduction that coming from a country with no written constitution, I'm very cynical about our constitution. And you encapsulated so many of my feelings. <laughs> I mean, really. Um, I walk around telling all my friends I hate the American constitution. And being Americans who were brought up to think that the constitution is sacred, I upset people a lot and get into just these arguments. I mean, wonderful. Um, anyway, enough of that. You've dealt with so many things. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, something that really resonates with me too is that there's a tendency for the people who take the Bible literally in a way that I do not believe are also largely the people who take the constitution literally. And I think we're down a very slippery slope there when white nationalism and the constitution get so linked together. I was reading an article in the LA Times, I think it was the LA Times, about Hungary and what's been going on there and how CPAC and all those people are over in Hungary for all their meetings. And I, I'd hate us to be following in that path. Thank you, <laughs> but it's <laughs> really a question. But it, <laughs> but it certainly looks as though we are. And it's a very particular form of white nationalism that we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, where, where I think the, the, the nuance is that and, and I know that this is a gross oversimplification, but folks are referring to a white Christian nationalism. And by Christian, 
what I think we're largely talking about are white evangelicals or very conservative Christians. Um, and in the Dobbs opinion, I think what you see at work is the elevation of a particular set of religious beliefs um, over all others. Um, and I don't think it's any accident that Justice Thomas in his concurring opinion <clears throat> takes the decision against abortion and then suggests that the rights to same-sex intimacy, to contraception, and to gay marriage uh, are questionable as well. Because if you look at all of these rights together, what is it that underlies them or undergirds them? Is they violate conservative Christian beliefs that marriage is between a man and a woman, sex should only occur in a, within the confines of a marriage and only for purposes of procreation. And so moral decisions um, are being dressed up as if they were uh, health related or science based um, when nothing could be further from the truth. Um, you know, one of the things that that is so stunning about Dobbs is it completely ignores the fact that carrying a pregnancy to term is 14 times more likely to be fatal than having an abortion, 14 times more likely. Um, when we look at it through the lens of race, though, it's even more stark. So the Dobbs decision comes out of Mississippi. And Mississippi, like many states that are in such a rush to deny the right to abortion, have profoundly problematic healthcare systems. So in Mississippi, a black person carrying a pregnancy to term is 88 more, times more likely to die uh, from carrying to term than from having an abortion, 88. Wow. That's astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the kinds of things that are completely ignored um, by the opinion and by this majority that really are enshrining a particular set of religious beliefs um, in law. Well, um, before we go on, I want to say for new people, if you um, go to, <clears throat> if you want to speak, go to participants, find your name, and it will say, give you the option of raise hand. Um, and please take your hand down once you speak. Uh, Richard. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to ask you to address the Electoral College, um, its origins, which are all, you know, uh, its origins, okay, um, and, uh, and its role in undercutting the popular vote, and, uh, and any possibility that you can imagine for getting rid of it, those three aspects. It's, um, it's something that uh, I, I wish I, I delved more into the history of it. Um, but at its core, it reflected a vision where the people were not to be trusted uh, in making these kinds of choices. Um, and it's important to recognize as much as we think of ourselves as a democracy, um, the extent to which the framers were actually afraid of democracy. Uh, so originally, uh, those who could vote uh, elected the members of the House, but it was the members of the House who selected the state senators. The Senate being deemed the more august body uh, those folks were elected by the people's representatives because the people could not be trusted to make a choice like that on their own. <laughs> uh, and in many respects, the electoral college reflects that same level of distrust uh, where you would have this body that would deliberate um, uh, these wise uh, people would select the wise person 
uh, who would who would become president uh, among those who who had run. Um, I think in in some ways the electoral college reflects the um, same kinds of concerns that the other structural aspects of our constitution, like the Senate, that were meant to prevent um, any effort from undoing slavery. Um, uh, you know, it was the place where those things could be dealt with sort of behind closed doors um, and with limited input. Now, obviously, the practice is much different. Um, we fully expect uh, the electors in the electoral college to uh, reflect the votes in their particular state. There is an effort uh, that is uh, afoot, and I think it was launched about 20 some years ago. Um, I, I believe it's called the National Electoral Voter Compact that says that the state's electors will be um, given or appointed to the candidate that wins the national uh, popular vote. As you can imagine, the states that have adopted this are all blue states and they are insufficient to get you to the 270 threshold. Uh, so they wouldn't have, it won't have any effect until that threshold is crossed. I don't know how much likelihood there is that that threshold will be crossed given the number of states that are Republican controlled um, and Republican controlled, not just the legislature, but the legislature and the governorship. Uh, it just seems highly unlikely that you would see that take effect. So then what you have is you're, you're stuck basically trying to amend the Constitution. And the Constitution puts its thumb on the scale against amendment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you would need uh, a supermajority of Congress uh, to approve a constitutional amendment being put forward. And then you would need a supermajority of the states individually approving the amendment. So you run into the same problem. Um, so it is, it is a very difficult issue. Um, and it's one that we're sort of stuck with. Um, and in some ways, our, our, our best hope is A, can we revive any sense of bipartisanship such that people will see that it is untenable to keep governing the way we are um, with the randomness that the electoral college introduces? Um, or we see a, a drastic political realignment that shifts power um, and undercuts the impact of the electoral college. And we may see that. We may see that as a result of decisions like Dobbs. Uh, I, I, I think that we will, it'll, it'll be something the political scientists will be analyzing very closely to see the effect of that decision on different voting blocks uh, within the Republican um, party. Um, so in many ways, I think that that is the hope that the overreach of the party undermines it to such an extent that the, that the impact mm -hmm. of the electoral college is mitigated either, either partially or completely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We have Phil, Stephen, Rebecca, and Anthony. So please be mindful of the time. And please take your hand down when you're through. Phil. <clears throat> yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm concerned about the accountability of the Supreme Court issue, uh, as many of you, I'm sure, are. Uh, the Constitution apparently totally ignored the issue of accountability in the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm wondering if you see uh, any light at the end of that tunnel. 
it's it's a really difficult question uh, because most of the 20th century is where our rights for in our understanding of our rights was carried out in and by and through the courts. Um, you know, we had a 20 to 30 year period with Earl Warren at the helm of the court where the constitution as we know it and as we understand it today was really given life. Um, so I worry uh, about taking that kind of power away from the Supreme Court and the courts. They were meant to be anti-democratic, um, but precisely to protect minorities from the tyranny of the majority. So you're absolutely right that what we're seeing now is very troubling, precisely because we're seeing the Supreme Court strip rights away, A, and it's doing it um, largely at the behest of a minority of the country. Um, and I don't know to what extent we can or should rein the Constitution, the Supreme Court in. You know, for, for many years now, conservatives in Congress have tried to strip away jurisdiction from the Supreme Court and the federal courts to limit what they could do when it comes to different civil rights and civil liberties issues or when they could address those issues or how they could address them. I think our better reform may be one that actually is possible. A majority, uh, a pretty strong majority of the public would be in favor of terms for Supreme Court justices. Um, and I do think that those kinds of proposals if you can explain the neutral, their neutral application, you know, the staggering of the justice's terms um, and the way in which you can't necessarily anticipate any advantage to one side or the other, I think that could have a profound effect. Um, really what we're living through in, these, in this period is the impact of the election of Richard Nixon in 1968 he had an unusual amount of vacancies that he had to fill. And so he shifted the court to the right. And as I said, in the last 20 years, we've had presidents without a majority appoint five justices, conservative justices to the Supreme Court um, and move the court decidedly to the right. Uh, it would be It would be valuable to try to balance it out because when you look at this 50 year period, there is a dramatic difference in the number of appointments by Republican presidents as opposed to Democratic presidents. And that's largely a result of, as I said, the Electoral College and, and its impact. Um, I think there is a way to explain to the larger public and to have both sides agree on a way of providing terms that would be meaningful. And I do think that this is an issue that is growing in importance. When you look at life tenure in 1789, you know, what was the expected lifespan of somebody put on the Supreme Court? They weren't expected to live to 75 or 80, let alone remain on the court till then. And you have an increasing um, trend towards appointing younger and younger justices who will be on the court for longer and longer periods of time. Um, so I think you're, you're seeing a sort of perfect storm created where I think you could get uh, a reform of that nature. Um, and I think it would be valuable. Oh, thank you. Stephen? Stephen, we're not hearing yeah, you. I, got, I haven't spoken yet. I was just getting oh. it's unmute button working. Hi, Hector. Thank you so much for your presentation. I appreciate it. And actually, everything you've said has answered the question that I, I've thought about, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. And perhaps 
it'll help enlarge on some of the aspects. The litigious, competitive, adversarial social order that democracy seems to catalyze has both positive attributes as well as it's very toxic, which we are experiencing these days. Do you feel that the work you do advances the positive to an extent that you feel a sense of fulfillment and forward um, momentum as opposed to the top toxic aspects of this characteristic of democracy and are we so prone to be embattled and polarized that the demise of democracy through dominance by the minority is inevitable? That is, that is a wonderfully, wonderfully crafted question. Uh, I started really wrestling with this about a year and a half ago. Steve knows that I, I started sharing early drafts of this with him. And uh, just recently, there was a wonderful article in The Atlantic. Um, I I, if I can find it, I will, I will uh, send it to you all after the, the, this, uh, this call is over. But it talked about how really we are not blue states and red states, that in some respects, you can look at ourselves as really a blue country and a red country that have coexisted through the life of this country. And that really the, the period uh, that I was pointing to with the Supreme Court and uh, the executive and Congress pushing forward rights, uh, particularly those of, of racial and other minorities was something of an aberration. Um, and that, the question of whether these two countries can coexist and how much longer they can coexist is a real one. Um, and I started to think about, well, what are the alternatives? Um, you know, what are the ways in which this conflict could be resolved? And one, you know, which a lot of public polls will tell you is a lot of folks, a lot of people believe that civil war is likely or that the prospect of civil war is becoming more likely. I don't know what that means, uh, given the awesome power of our federal military to think in terms of a civil war. I, I, I just can't even picture what that would look like. Um, so I, I don't give that much credence. I think that what we're more likely to see and in some respects is, is sort of worse than civil war, is living under a structure where the mi political minority is dictating to the political majority um, in the way that I defined it earlier. I'm not talking about uh, groups of people by race, ethnicity, gender, political, a political minority dictating national key policy to the rest of the country. In some respects, that that may be worse. Um, you you think it's almost as if the civil war had come out the other way, and we were living in the aftermath of it. Um, and I started to think about, well, what does that mean? What can we do? How can we resist that? And I I have to say that I found myself questioning. Uh, a lot of our my work um, and whether it was really um, meaningful. And through that really dark period of questioning, um, uh, you know, my impact and my choice, um, I found myself recommitted. Uh, a because it's the path of justice, but B, I really don't know what the alternative is. Um, I can't conceive of just curling up in a ball, closing my eyes and pretending that what's happening isn't happening. Um, so I've, I've decided, I've recommitted to the work and with a sense of humility, that there's only so much I can control about my world. 
but the portion of this world that I have control over to whatever extent, I'm going to focus on making that as just uh, as I possibly can. Um, and within the confines of everything that I've discussed today, as Steve was alluding to in terms of our local agenda, uh, whether here in Los Angeles or LA County or California, there are ways in which we can profoundly advance the cause of justice. Uh, you know, with, with the uh, overturning of Roe, there are estimates that 30% of all clinics in the country, abortion clinics could be in California as more and more states move to shutter uh, clinics and, and ban abortions. It will be essential and it will be incumbent on California to live up to the promise that it has made to make itself a haven for abortions. So A, there is an effort underway to make crystal clear, we believe it's already clear, but this would make it even more clear that the right to abortion is protected in the California constitution. We also need to ensure that everyone who wants an abortion in California can obtain one. As much as we live in a state that is at the sort of progressive leading edge, we have access issues where not everyone who wants an abortion can actually obtain one. Um, there are many counties in our state that don't, do not have a single abortion provider. Um, there are many folks who the only hospitals in range are Catholic hospitals uh, that uh, abide by uh, the Council of Bishops um, dictates when it comes to abortion and other uh, medical services. Um, and California in various ways has allowed these hospitals to um, exempt themselves um, from providing the medical services that, that are needed by Californians and now increasingly by others who will come to California for these services. Um, you know, as I said, that statistic about the fatality of carrying to term versus having an abortion, um, that alone should make clear the extent to which abortion is uh, healthcare. Um, so I, I hope I hope Stephen that answers um, your question, um, and um, I think it does put urgency on not only being active locally, but being aware of what's going on elsewhere around the country. Um, someone earlier was mentioning, uh, you know, the congressional race, the Senate race in Pennsylvania. Uh, we should be concerned, and we should be active. Uh, in Pennsylvania and Georgia, these are critical elections that the, the country is facing. Um, I think we have to have conversations with family, friends, and neighbors who may not agree with us. We have to find a way to talk to them, uh, maybe not through facts and figures, uh, but maybe through our own experience and try to reach them and try to see if we can help them gain a different perspective on things. I, I've been astounded to see the potential impact that the January 6 hearings are having on some folks who were confirmed in their beliefs a year ago as to what happened and who was responsible for it. Um, it, it shows that there is a way to reach people who seemed unreachable. Um, so I think that's the challenge before us um, is to do this really hard work locally, regionally, uh, at the state level and across the country to educate and organize ourselves so that we are such a majority that these anti-democratic features that I highlighted don't have the impact that they have had recently. Thank you. Carol, okay. Fran Carol Francis, I'm sorry, I apologize. I can't, my screen is all goofed up and I can't seem to fix it. Could you just put me on the list at the end of it for a question if there's time? Thank you. Who is it? Linda, Global Ops. Okay. Sorry. Uh, all right. Um, somebody just came. Uh, so, Rebecca? Hi, Hector. Thank you so much um, for.
for for the talk. Very informative. My question is twofold on the recent um, LA County Board of Supervisors measure to um, adopt um, um, a ballot measure um, to remove the sheriff by four fifths of a vote, um, which the ACLU SoCal does support. So my first question is what civil liberties um, interests are we protecting by supporting this measure, which essentially would undo an election of a duly elected sheriff. Um, he was elected in the last election and he's a front runner now for, um, and um, the second part of my question is, has, has the attorney general investigated any of the allegations that led to um, the board adopt, adopting this measure? And so, um, Given the background on my on my concern is that um, the sheriff has said that if he you know once he's not sheriff anymore, he's going to run for board of supervisor. And you know if this measure was to pass, I mean, do we really? If the tables were turned and somebody like Villanueva could be sitting on the board and with the power to remove a progressive sheriff, is is that what we want? So, but my question more is to the civil liberties issues that we're trying to protect. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that you have to uh, credit the sheriff with is he's a very effective politician. And he has tried to catch this uh, measure being solely about him. And that could not be further from the truth. Um, the ACLU sued the county and the sheriff in 1975 over conditions prevailing in LA County jails. Uh, folks forced to sleep on the floor because there were not enough beds. Uh, folks who were not given even an hour of fresh air or exercise because the jail was so overcrowded. Uh, folks who were not receiving medical care as needed. Um, that has essentially been ongoing since 1985. And it has not mattered what sheriff has been in office. Um, there has been abuse in the jails carried out by the sheriff's department, often condoned or ignored or covered up by the sheriff. So this effort to give the Board of Supervisors power and uh, authority over the sheriff um, is one that organizations like ours have been advocating for a long time. Um, and this long precedes uh, Sheriff Villanueva. And I think it's important that when you look back at the undoing of Sheriff Baca, he was undone by allegations that sheriffs were routinely beating uh, inmates, using excessive force, and then failing to investigate, or if they did investigate, whitewashing uh, what had happened, and often retaliating against the um, folks who complained. He argued that if people were unhappy with his performance, the only recourse was at the next election, that the people would vote him out. Um, and that allowed him to remain in office and to allow these abuses to occur on a daily basis for years because the Board of Supervisors really the purse. Uh, they could deny him a budget. But how likely is that and how, how meaningful is that really? Um, so when we look at this, what we're interested in is the rights of folks who have been convicted um, to be free of cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment. And for the large percentage of folks who have not yet been convicted, who are pretrial detainees, 
who simply can't afford bail. And I think, I think about 40% of the folks in county jail are there pre-trial. They have a due process right not to be subjected to any punishment because they haven't been convicted yet. So all of these folks have very strong constitutional rights at play that our current system has largely ignored and forced us to go to court to litigate um, over and over and over again. Um, you know, in 2012, we sued the sheriff over the violence and abuse that was going on. That was largely upheld and we ultimately prevailed in court. There was a commission that was created to study violence in the jails and found that it was prevalent and that it was coming at the direction uh, 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 from the top. Um, and the jails for not providing access to those who have disabilities, um, chairs, um, you know, forced to uh, go to the bathroom or take showers without the handrails or the uh, supports that they need um, for basic, um, you know, human functions. Um, so I think I think you you understand there are profound civil liberties and civil rights issues at stake here um, that haven't been addressed, and our system is one where you lay down a rule and. It applies to everybody. So if he were to run for office and be on the county, so be it. Um, the question would be whether he would be able to gain enough support from the other board of supervisors to remove a sheriff, A, and B, would there be justification? Um, because it's not removal at a whim. It's removal under specific circumstances. It's when there is a pattern of um, mismanagement and denial of rights that rises to a certain level. Um, and the reason that we as an organization, the ACLU, can be involved in removing an elected official, we have very explicit policy that says that we can only be involved in impeaching an official um, when there is a uh, present ongoing threat to civil rights and civil liberties from their continued um, uh, presence in office. Um, so that's that's what I would say regarding the LA County Charter Amendment. And, and the second part, um, has there been any investigation by the AG into any of these allegations that led to the ballot measure? Uh, I don't know what you mean, the allegations that led to the I mean, a lot of these allegations are ongoing scandals. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, you know, there are reports from the inspector general that have been incredibly damning of the sheriff. Uh, the sheriff has refused to cooperate with the inspector general. Uh, the sheriff has refused to cooperate with the board of supervisors. I don't know what status, what their, what the AG has been doing or not. Um, but these are ongoing scandals yes. <laughs> right now, and there are many of them. Um, and I will say, as, as one last uh, footnote here, that this effort was largely dead in the water a year ago. There wasn't the appetite to go forward with this charter amendment and take on Villanueva, precisely because he is such an effective politician. But community groups, you know, families of those who have suffered at the hands of deputies would not relent. Um, and we and other advocates, we, we didn't walk away. And these scandals gave more oxygen to this effort. Um, and there are many of them going on right now. Um, and it is astonishing to read some of these things that are going on where there are gangs within the sheriff's department and the sheriff denies that there are gangs. He appoints somebody to investigate whether there are gangs, but he doesn't allow the person to use the word gang. Uh, uh, there is a very Kafka-esque quality to, to what's going on, and we think this charter amendment is one way to fix it. Uh, thank you. That's really good to hear something specific about what we're doing right now. Uh, Anthony. 
Well, uh, Hector, again, I want to thank you for uh, your analysis. I want to make sure I got the statistic right. You said something like by 2040, 30% of the country uh, will have 70 senators, something like that. Is that what you? Yes. Because right now uh, I was looking it up. You know, you your statistic was that uh, 50% of the uh, senators uh, represent only 43%. So this is dramatic. This would basically make a mockery of democracy in America. It would be, and that's only 20 years, less than 20 years from now, right? It would. And so, and, and I think that everything that we're talking about yeah. is interrelated. Right. You know, for so many years, the Republican attitude when it comes to immigration right. has been to make life so unbearable mm -hmm. that undocumented people would self-deport. Yeah. yeah. When you so look at the states that are banning abortion now that are attacking the LGBTQ community, I think you may see a mass migration of folks out of these states to yeah. blue states that are going to make the red states even redder and accelerate the yeah. trends that we are already seeing uh, develop. Yeah. So, so my, I I put in the chat a book that I read a few a couple of years ago by Nancy McLean, Democracy in Chains, and that was an eye opener for me because um, it really documents clearly that the minority party has known it was a minority for decades. And uh, it wasn't that interested in specific legislation as much as in changing the system so they could rule. Uh, and uh, they've been very successful in implementing their plan. They have the plan, they worked it, they've succeeded. Uh, so do we, uh, progressives who are, are pro-democracy, are we, do we have a plan? Does the ACLU have a plan? Do we have uh, a way going forward so that we can somehow, I mean, we are the majority and we will continue to be uh, in this country, it looks like, for, 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 for the duration. Absolutely. Is there, is there, is, do you see a plan evolving comparable to the plan that uh, Nancy McLean talks about in her book that conservatives developed and implemented and succeeded in? Do we have a plan? I, you know, I think it's interesting that when something, when an effort is successful, it becomes, in retrospect, it's looked upon as somewhat inevitable. And I do think that their success here, we want to ascribe a level of intentionality that I'm not sure was necessarily there. I'm not sure there was this grand plan. I think they pushed and pulled every lever and every button they could. Um, and we are where we are, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that in many ways, that's what we need to be doing, pushing and pulling every lever and button. Um, I think that folks who care about what's happening in our country should care very deeply about what's happening in our schools. And I think when a school board has a meeting they need to be hearing from progressive folks in the community um, who don't want our children taught a whitewashed version of our history. Um, you know, arguments about critical race theory aside, uh, there, there's almost an attempt to completely rewrite our history and take out all of the <laughs> bad parts. Um, and we should care deeply about that. And, when you turn on the local news, what you see are the, you know, rabid folks who are upset about this book or that book or this course or that course. I don't see the progressive chorus there arguing the, the counter opinion. Um, and I think we need to be there. Um, I think the decisions about what books are chosen, you know, in a district or in a state are really critical decisions. Um, and I think that in many ways they have outflanked us uh, by taking politics to a really hyper local level. And I think we need to do the same um, as much as we need to be uh, following the election in Pennsylvania and Georgia. We need to be aware of what's going on in LAUSD too um, and active and voicing ourselves there. Um, 
I think that voting rights are critical for us going forward and fighting these ele uh, efforts of political gerrymandering, um, fighting these efforts at uh, redistricting. Um, I think that ultimately what we also need to see and in the same way that you look at the country as two countries sort of coexisting, I think within the Democratic Party, you have a couple of parties coexisting. Um, and I think one of the things that has happened is the corporate side of the party tends to prevail and we get watered down versions of progressive proposals. Um, and I think that folks on the Democratic side have to push for what they really want. Um, and if their elected officials are not pushing as hard as they want for the things that they want, they've got to vote those folks out too. Um, I, I think the extent to which uh, folks on the progressive side are being represented uh, you know, it was astonishing to read in the week after Dobbs was handed down that the president was apparently uh, in the midst of carrying out a plan to um, elevate a uh, attorney general, a US attorney general who was anti-choice. Um, I, I just don't see how you can do that. Um, uh, so I think we have to fight anywhere and everywhere we can for every advantage we can and to enshrine the things that we believe in. And I think what we will see over time is that it will take shape. And then when we've succeeded, it will look like it was all part of a coordinated plan, um, even if it wasn't. Um, I, I really, I, I really think that uh, there's sort of a, uh, what is it, a mis uh, the misattribution theory. When somebody does harm to you, you assume it was intentional. When you do harm to others, you want them to understand that it was not intentional. Um, I, I think there's some something similar going on where we just assume that they are so well organized and uh, they stick to their talking points and they stick to the plan. Um, I, I, I don't know the extent to which I believe that's true. It doesn't mean they haven't been really powerfully effective. And it doesn't mean that certain structural um, uh, aspects of our system haven't worked out to their advantage. Um, uh, you know, the way the country's demographics have changed, that's something they didn't plan. That, that sort of happened and evolved in the way that it has. Um, but certainly, um, they, uh, they do engage in politics in a way that I think is very different from the progressive side. And I think we need to match that energy and that perseverance that they have shown.